Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. What is the most exciting Ravnica Allegiance spoiler that we haven't talked about yet that you've seen so far? Uh, well, I mean, there are a bunch, so where to even start? Um, I don't know. What do you think of uh, Bedevil? Bedevil is... I think a Bedevil was highest on my list until very recently, but we should talk about yeah. Bedevil. Yeah, Bedevil is BB... R, so three mana, uh, basically same as Hero's Downfall, but you got to have a red instead of that Carlos. And it's an instant destroy target artifact, creature, or planeswalker. So it's a Hero's Downfall that also hits artifacts. For an R, right? So instead of that color, but, it's switched right, to Right, so it's not R. even more mana. It's still just three. Yeah. You've yeah, said, man. You've said on multiple occasions that you think that Hero's Downfall is a pretty good modern card. So, but Definitely. Definitely. Want- it's okay. It's a. It's a. It's a. It is a modern card. I think Bedevil's. It, it, you know. I think Bedevil's better, though, to be sure. I think Bedevil is going to be a very solid player, certainly in standard. Um, it, it offers flexibility. I mean, it's it's just hero's downfall, but can also take out the immortal sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, and obviously, what artifacts come and go is, I mean, it's going to change over the next couple of years. But, um, I mean, Heroes Downfall alone is already slam dunk, and so Heroes Downfall with the added flexibility of hitting artifacts, this card is a big, big, big game, so major player. Certainly going to be staple in standard, and I think just per your comment on on um, Heroes Downfall, it's probably going to see some some wider play also. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just more fun. I mean, it, one of the best parts of a Heroes Downfall is the ability to use it in just like a straight blue-black deck, which obviously Bedevil doesn't do. But Heroes Downfall did have some applications at times as uh, an additional option for um, Grixis decks that would sometimes want to have not only the added flexibility of answers to stuff, you know, like uh, you know, obviously Teferi and Jace the Mind Sculptor, but also every random creature. And uh, Bedevil does have the weakness of not being able to hit like a protection from red creature the way the Hero's Downfall can. Oh. But but being an instant is such a better combination with Snapcaster Mage than uh, and just various other instants than Dreadbore. You know, that was always one of the big forms of tension is that Dreadbore does what you want, but it's slow. And the the ability for Bedevil to actually break you out of certain things, like just giving you more ways to break a lantern lock or to hit a cranial plating or whatever, you know, like the there's there's no shortage of artifacts in in modern, but in standard, Hero's Downfall is it's incredible, right? Oh, I think this card is going to be amazing in standard, right? Like like I said, um, the the some of the artifacts are so significant, like I. Can't, the number of times that either I've been attempted to do this myself or I've seen like very good players do it in 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 big tournament matches, which is to use like a conclave tribunal on a treasure map. You know, like wouldn't you rather bedevil I mean, obviously these are different colors, right? But like I feel like bedeviling a treasure map I would rather do than using a conclave tribunal on it. Um, for various reasons, right? One of, you know, one of which is that it's less mana, another one of which is, like, you, you have, like, more windows to get them because it's an instant. Um, but then also, the fact that if you are, you know, conclave tribuning a, a tri- conclave tribunaling a treasure map, like, you're kind of scared of where it's going to go, and oftentimes decks that um, have treasure maps in them can remove your conclave tribunal, so, you know... Uh, they just the fact that you, they can get back to where that is uh, is going to be a little bit better with Bedevil than it is with Conclave Pro- Tribunal. But then I think, moreover, just the big artifacts that people play in Standard, you know, the Immortal Sun is the is the gaudiest at six. Like, that's such a good situation to be in, right? Somebody taps out for six, then you just get them. I mean, like, when are people bringing in the Immortal Sun? Like, either they've got a main deck, in rare cases, like, you know, Naya Ramp. But usually they're doing it to take out your Ral or your Teferi, you know, some real big um, Planeswalkers or, I guess, 
I guess this deck might have an Angrath, right? Um, but well, I, I don't know. I think that you're making a really good point, though. The entire plan of the Immortal Sun is, uh, you know, as a sideboard option, and it hinges on it dodging the interaction that Vraska's Contempt hits. You know, it dodging the sort of creatures and planeswalkers that most people rely on to generate advantages. That Bedevil gives you access to. Uh, to answers that incidentally also kill the immortal sun, removing that sort of avenue of sidestepping. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an impactful change. Yeah, the, like a, just the easiest example would be like people bringing in the immortal sun against Vivian Reed, right? Like you're like, all right, Vivian Reed is my main way to destroy artifacts and enchantments at all. The immortal sun obviously turns off Vivian Reed. Um, if you have a class of cards that you know, just does this incidentally, right? Like, it's mostly there to kill somebody's, you know, giant dinosaur or whatever, not their, not, um, not their artifact, but it does that job. Like, I think that kind of, at least, I guess, against a, a, black, a deck that's a black-red, it kind of undoes that entire plan. I, I think also, like, Vraska's Contempt has been so good for so long First of all, just having access to more Vraska's Contempts is already interesting. But the biggest bottleneck with Vraska's Contempt is that four mana is so glutted for some decks. You have such steep competition from things like whether it's Ravenous Chupacabra or Karn or or any number of you know card drawers or other powerful threats. Four is such a high, high, high competition spot. Being oh, yeah. able I mean, to play less Vraska's Contempts in some decks in order to support Bedevil so that you have access to that more of that effect but can have more four spots for other powerful cards, that, I think, is subtly just really, really influential. Yeah, I mean, just looking at these colors, right, like, you imagine there are certain decks that want Vraska's Contempt or, you know, at least want the effect of a Vraska's Contempt could be casting Nico Bolas for the same amount of mana. Right, like just think about that for a second. Like how much proactive, just power level a Nico Bolas is versus, um, you know, just having a spot removal spell. Which at the end totally. of the day, Contempt is a great spell. You know, I've argued it was one of the most important cards in, in standard, but like it's a one for one removal card. It's not the same thing as Nico Bolas getting going, right? Or even well, Nico Bolas hitting the board. Well, part of it is also that Vraska's Contempt, like the delta between Vraska's Contempt and Nico Bolas, is nowhere near the delta between Bedevil and other three-cost options. So, like, your value of a replacement is actually quite high, because if you change some of your four drops, even if you think, even if you like Vraska's Contempt better than Nico Bolas, or whatever your four drop is, the Sprekindling Phoenix, anything, whatever, right? Even if you like the Vraska's Contempt more, the amount more that you would like Vraska's Contempt over those powerful threats is probably not as much as the amount that Bedevil is better than the three-cost options for decks like this. Oh, yeah. Definitely agree. I think it. I think Bedevil is an enormous upgrade to a lot of the cards we might cast at three, um, at least in these color combinations. I think it's going to do its job extraordinarily well, and I think we agree that it's going to see some larger larger format play. Yeah, so what's the one that's got your eye? Absorb. <laughs> oh, come on. Bedevil's got to be higher than Absorb, right? Really? Absorb is, Absorb is great. Don't get me wrong. Absorb is great. But it's just, it's not like, the how much value of a replacement could Absorb over Sinister, sinister Sabotage even have? I mean, people, There's a little. People go out of their way to play, like, rando cards to gain three life. Yeah. It's, like, I mean, I, I think that this card is just, it's so, I mean, obviously Undermine is not in this set, right? We've already had a Demir set. But... Like, the difference between Absorb and Undermine when they came out the first time, like, Undermine is very similar to Ionize, right? Um, and the two... Yeah, definitely, but get, Ionize is good. It's good. It's yeah, very it's good. good. First yep. of all, I think Ionize is substantially better than Undermine because it's red, right? And, and it's, it's easier to cast. Yeah, it is, but it's in a color combination that just cares about tinging you for two, even if it's not tinging you for three. But, like, the ability to gain three life, incidentally... I think this card is just going to be utterly backbreaking. 
Um, yeah, obviously. It is in a color combination that's already very well supported. So having access, you know, picking up both Absorb and Hallowed Fountain. Yeah, Hallowed Fountain is. <laughs> that's a great that's combo, a too. Breaker. That's a great combo. Oh, yeah. I remember oh, when. Yeah. I still remember when Hallow Fountain was printed the first time and you were on the page of, okay, Hallow Fountain is going to revolutionize standard. Like, you don't even need to know what are the Azorius cards are because Hallow Fountain, like, you were playing blue-white before Azorius even got his support. Yeah, it was just basically like, look, let's look at the card pool that we have. We could just start out with the blue-red decks that people are already playing and then just make them into blue-white decks and they're actually just better <laughs> And the blue red decks that people are playing now because like the blue cards is you know the kind of the tapping out for dragons part is where it's at but you know once we start getting cards like faith's fetters in our sideboard in wrath of god like it's such an upgrade versus you know just just the the red removal options um mm-hmm. And for less mana than we're already paying for our threats right so you're often in a situation where you're like all right i'm a wrath first and dragon later like, that was fine. <laughs> but yes, I think that right now, if you look at the composition of the Jeskai decks, we're largely seeing Sinister Sabotage, relatively little ionized, not even for Sinister Sabotage in most cases. I think maybe not in Jeskai, maybe not necessarily in Esper. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where this is, but spots that are currently Sinister Sabotage, people are going to definitely consider Absorb. And I think that ultimately there are going to be decks that flock to 4x absorb. I, I don't currently envision a universe where we have like 4 absorb and multiple centers or sabotage or ionize. But I think absorb, at least for Jeskai, Esper, etc., the, the blue white options, um, are going are gonna to want this card first. So I, uh, at my fr- like there was a part of me that was instinctually reacting to absorb with like, oh, what does this mean for our mountains? Right. But, 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 but the printing of Hallowed Fountain, like you can play 12 Shocklands and then 12 of the, you know, I guess Glacial Fortress types. And then uh, you don't have to play very many basics in your deck at all, right? Like you just play like a couple islands and no mountains. It's not like Jeskai was like eager to play mountain in the first place, right? Like, Absorb might actually, the biggest loser might actually be Niv-Mizzet, right? I think that, I look, I, I think that there might be more, like, more than one distinct style, right? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It, it would be shocking to me if Niv-Mizzet just hit the bench and was just permanent. No, 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 I don't mean Niv-Mizzet hitting the bench. I mean that if you want Absorb, it might be that you have to sacrifice the amount of niv Mizzeting you do. Um, I, I do think that's possible, yeah. Like, I think that Absorb doesn't really get along well with, like, the 4x niv Mizzet dive-down strategy. Right. Uh, but there are other Jeskai decks, you know. Like, I, for example, I think Absorb might be good in one of these, like, 4x treasure map decks. I think that mm-hmm. that's a that's kind of a, a good two three. Um, uh, in fact, I, I don't know. I think Absorb is probably pretty good in the the Chemistry's Insight decks. Definitely. Uh, so no, I think you're right. I I'm very when I say I'm excited by Absorb, the part of me that likes to cast Rekindling Phoenixes and you know Goblin Chain Whirlers is like, oh no, this card is terrible for me. But the part of me that's just like. Oh wow! This is a great card for for the new set. Um, I think I own a set of this from back in the day. They will look cool when I play them. <laughs> sure. Although the new art is definitely uh, you know not weak. Um, what did you think of the of the new mechanic? Emergency powers uh, made good use of it. Addendum, which is basically uh, a bunch of instants that have this word that if you cast. The, this card during your main phase, you get kind of a kicker bonus. Oh, of course I love it. I mean, this is just right up my alley for blue. Like, absolutely right up my alley. You want to start with uh, emergency powers? Yeah, yeah. This one's okay. kind of exciting over the top. So five white blue, uh, like you said, was an instant. Um, each player shuffles their hand and graveyard into their library, then draws seven cards. Exile Emergency Powers. So it's got this Time Twister element, right? Um, yep. Second Time Spiral. 
Yeah. Then um, it's got the addendum. If you cast this spell during your main phase, you may put a permanent card with converted mana cost seven or less from your hand onto the battlefield. So I think that I think this card's really exciting. And at the same time, I think it maybe it's not it's not a platinum hit. Um, I'll tell you why. Why the uh, the times the time spiralish kind of kind of cards encourage a deck to play a bunch of cheap stuff to get out of their hand. The the and then that makes the draw seven part of it asymmetrical, right? So if I dump my hand and I have no cards in my hand. And you have like three cards or five cards. Let's say you have three cards in hand, right? And then we, we both draw seven. I draw seven, but you only draw four, right? That's kind of how how um, that card works. And obviously, the biggest implementation of this uh, was in the the high tide decks of Extended at, at the end of the nineteen nineties, right? So you would dump out high tides, which cost you to make mana, and like turnabouts, which made mana. And then you had free casting cost um, counter spells like Force of Will to force through your combo. And like, all right, I'm going to deplete my hand. We both draw seven, but I'm basically draw seven and you're drawing fewer than seven. Right. So on a net basis, right, you're drawing seven. But if you had three or four cards, then, you know, you don't get as much benefit. Um, or you could think about it like in the Wheel of Fortune sense. And the best use of that was when you did it uh, at, at Worlds back in 2007, um, where you played, you know, also a storm combo type of deck. So you're like, dump stuff out of my hand, or this is a card that helped you withstand disruption, right? Like somebody's stressing you, and they're taking your your cards that you want to dump out of your hand away, and then this is a, a refill capability for a deck that otherwise has a bunch of cheap stuff to get out of their hand. The problem with that is, um, that's kind of at odds with the addendum of dumping a really really powerful card unless you know i'm just trying to imagine how i would want to build a deck where like i had a bunch of cheap stuff and then like a small number of just really expensive super threats is that i mean how are you how are you envisioning this or maybe i've got a completely wrong read from from um kind of antecedent cards well let's see um here's some some exciting hits to put down niv mizzet Nazahal Primal Tide. Uh, I mean, like, if you're just playing some kind of uh, a normal game and you have this at the top, you know, like, I don't know, is that so bad? Is that so wrong? Besides, don't you just want to play Rivers Rebuke on six and this on seven, and then you're on your way? All right, in. <laughs> I and thought that's so. That's the best. Yeah, that sounds awesome, actually. I actually wouldn't mind... I wouldn't mind casting this as an instant sometimes. Yes, 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 yes. Like, for instance, on your opponent's end step, you just cast this, and then you untap and you do some really good stuff. You do some really powerful stuff to him, you know? Well, the other thing is, if you've already gotten to miss it in play and you cast this... Like... <laughs> well, plus, what if you do this on their end step, untap, play a bunch of cheap cards, and then do this again? I'm in. All right. So you think this one's a hit? No. No. But it's going to be worth looking at and trying my money's against. Yeah. The, the, I think I think there's a, a little bit at odds here. Also, there's just... I think that the card advantage that we largely see in Standard is about really cheap down payments, not about, um, not about like, just profound amounts of, like, bulk card. Um, I, I think like Niv Mizzet breaks that paradigm a little bit, but at least you get a giant creature along the way. Like most of them are like that are really, really popular and successful right now. Range from like Search for Escanta, Treasure Map. Um, you know, the, even the Jeskai Control decks don't play a lot of Chemistry's Insights. Some of them play none, right, and then just have a lot of Treasure Maps. You know, some of them have like one. Um, I think Chemistry's Insight has largely been completely extincted. Uh, from is it decks and you know in favor of of cards that um you know just have a, a small down payment and give you a return later even if those cards themselves are not instants or sorceries index with drake drake and niv which all feed on instants and sorceries so i think like 
I don't know. No, there's no Sphinx's revelation in standard right now. You know what I mean? Like nobody's casting a tidings. Like there's no. Just- well, there is. I mean, what about the expansion explosion? It's slow, but that's that is that right? That's true. Yeah, but I, you know, maybe maybe my paradigm is off. I you think, think that's that, just too slow. I think of it as like a fireball, like not as a card drawing spell. Mm, I don't know. I like it more as a tidings than a fireball. Yeah. I think, yeah. like, at the beginning of the format, especially when that card was just gaining a small amount of momentum in certain types of Jeskai, the Golgari decks were terrified of it because that would beat them, right? Like, they would play this totally. sort of, like, um, onesie-twosie game, and they've got, like, all right, I've got a one-for-one, one, I've got a, a two-for-one, I've got another two-for-one, and then Jeskai would slightly fall behind. They'd have a Vrasus attempt for their... To ferry, they'd be like, "All right, I'm, I'm within within striking distance, but I haven't closed the game out yet." And then all of a sudden, they're just like brained for ten or something. And then in the course of doing that, the I guess in the course of doing that, the opponent would draw another expansion explosion and finish them. So I guess oh. the, the card drawing part was also just as important as the fireball part. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, hey, actually, on the note of Chemister's Insight type things, what do you think of Sphinx's Insight as the uh, Azorius Chemister's Insight? So uh, Sphinx's Insight is two white-blue for an instant. Um, Draw two cards, but it's got the same addendum we were talking about a second ago. If you cast it uh, during your main phase, you gain two life. Um, I, I don't see this... Knocking Chemistry's Insight off. I would not be in for this if the addendum was free. If you just got the draw two cards and gain two health, gain two life, you know, I maybe, maybe. But the fact that you have to, like, tap out to get anything better than an inspiration, I am not in. Yeah, I, I, I don't... I think Chemistry's Insight is substantially more powerful than this. Like, this... The, I can't fathom tapping out main phase to draw, to draw two cards for four. <laughs> I can, but you got to be playing one of those, uh, you know, some kind of Aliantrazi, you know, Bant ramp deck where you're just like, hey, I was going to just play it main phase anyway. Really? But, nah, yeah. I don't know. I bet you can do better, though. Yuck. No. Uh, nah. I think we're in agreement. doesn't matter. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but speaking of big things that cost four, might be a little bit better than a Sphinx's Insight. Uh Simic got a four. That might be a little, little more exciting than that. Zagana. The, Zag- the Zagana Rama. Zagana Utopian Speaker. Two green blue for a four four legendary creature, Merfolk Wizard. With a lot of text. What did you think with the, about Zagana? I, I think you're right. I think it has a lot of text. So when Zagana <laughs> enters the battlefield, if you control another creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it, draw a card. Well, that's interesting. Right? Like, right off the bat, if you have another creature that with a, has a counter, it's like a crackling drake sort. You know, where it's like a powerful threat that's replacing itself. And then it has this ability of four green blue, adapt four. If this creature has no plus one plus one counters on it, put four plus one plus one counters on it. So your four four that drew you a card, in theory, maybe, you know, you can pay six and now you have an eight eight. And as a note, each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it has trample. Including itself if it's got the plus one plus one counters a little bit down the line. Yeah, yeah, this card's exciting, right? I think this is a very, very solid threat, provided there is a deck that um, wants both blue and green. Yeah, I mean, it's going to come down to what kind of creatures there are that just have plus one, plus one counters, incidentally, right? Yeah, so, I mean, it's not that you would be completely unwilling to pay anything for them, right? But if you don't have a creature with a plus one, plus one counter in the first three turns of the game at a high level of regularity... I think that the incentive to playing Zagana at all is quite low, right? But if you're like, all right, most of the time I've got a a creature with plus one, plus one counter somewhere in the first three turns, then this card becomes, like, I think pretty good. Like, it's not backbreakingly powerful on its face, but the fact, like, but its upside is really, really strong, kind of, kind of going long. Like, if you have, like, four copies in your deck, 
you know, you play one, and then, you know, even if it gets coiled, like, first time around, which I think will be a common thing for it to happen, or Justice Striked, or something like that, you know, it might just have drawn you to a second Sagana. And they can only do that so many times, because you keep gaining value. So, I, when I see this card, I think it's kind of actually less a plus one, plus one counter build around, and more a merfolk build around. Now, it is a merfolk, but if you notice, the merfolk... They got uh, the Merfolk enablers and rewards and things. They're heavy on plus one plus one counters. You know, uh, I don't know if the you know if the if the deck will be right for it. But Deep Root Champion is obviously a source of a lot of plus one plus one counters. Deep Root Elite, another good plus one plus one counter creature for a Merfolk deck. Um, obviously, Silver Guild doesn't have plus one plus one counters, but it's just. It, it provides a legit incentive to just get over the finish line with enough merfolk and Zagana being a merfolk matters. And then, um, obviously there's a, uh, variety of little ways to get counters here and there, you know, with, uh, depending on what all you're going to be doing. I mean, like you could do, there's the mediocre explore variation. I mean, there's stuff like Jade bearer, you know, green for a 1-1, one, one, when it enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target merfolk you control. Right, so there's 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 lots of little things you could be doing. Jade Light Ranger, though, is like, that's the real, that's that's the super dope merfolk that gets plus one, plus one counters. Oh, yeah. I, I guess, like, you could just play, like, the merfolk branch walker, Jade Light Ranger, uh, direction, which obviously has been uber powerful and popular in Golgari, I mean, those are two creatures that can line up ahead of Zagana that have plus and plus encounters with high regularity. Right, and and I mean, it's possible you end up uh, wanting to be more plus one plus one counter deck themed instead. Um, we'd have to see a bunch more, you know, reasons or you know incentives to actually do this. But there's a few things out there. Like Wild Growth Walker is obviously a pretty exciting plus one plus one counter card if you just have four Jailer Rangers and four Merfolk Branch Walkers in your deck. People been doing it. Yep. And then uh, it's not out of the question to play Vine Shaper Mystic as a Merfolk enabler. But um, the uh, depending on how you end up going, I mean there you know, there's there's a few miscellaneous plus one plus one counter creatures that are actually just worth considering, you know, like Pelt Collector, for instance. That's a good card. You know, I, I was just thinking about this um, to myself with, uh, you know, some of the cards that you were listing a second ago, but what about just kind of a splash? Like, what if we go, like, mini Soul Tie? A, a lot of the cards that you said are played in at least some versions of Golgari, and you're just like, all right, what if I just had a slight blue splash for this and some sideboard cards? I think you can get by and be pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, the possibility of playing a true Simic deck is going to really come down to what sort of interaction exists, because uh, at the moment, we haven't seen anything yet that addresses the single biggest chasm in the Simic strategy, right? Like, you, like just having, like, a couple bounce cards and a couple cards that tap stuff, that's not going to cut it in standard right now, you know? Yeah, but that's actually kind of where I was going in my head, which is you could play this next to, like... Um, Finality, right, which is a, a massive source of plus and plus encounters, but also solves the problem that um, that you were implying, right? Like they can do yeah. a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there. So the new the, there is the new Simic, I guess, removal spell. Um, curious your thoughts on incubation incongruity. Incubation is the uh, so this is that this is the split card where incubation is uh, Simic. You can pay a blue or a green to uh, sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library, and uh, you can put a creature from among them uh, into your hand. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order, so you get kind of a commune with the gods type of thing, you know. Or 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 you can use incongruity, which is one green blue. Exile target creature, that creature's controller creates a 3 3 green frog lizard. Uh, Classic frog lizards. Not in, not in. Uh, like, I think that the, the cheap version, like, when we see variations of that kind of a card that have been so strong in various formats and various types over the course of the last couple of years, usually it's as a result of being able to find mana. 
Um, and I don't, I don't think people want to play the one that just finds a creature very often. Uh, and I think, like, three mana is a ton to add. Well, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me you didn't ever play with Commune with Nature? I personally don't think I ever played with Commune with Nature. No. Even in Kamigawa? No. You were I played a really? green deck in Kamigawa, and I didn't play that card. Yeah. See, I, I, think, I don't think Commune with Nature is, like, great or anything, but I think it's fine. So Adrian Sullivan innovated playing that card, and he was an early adopter of Sensei's Divining Top. And I think that... One of the reasons why it was so good in his deck was because it would just reset Sensei's Divining Top. Um, but, you know, I I was more of a Cultivate kind of person for, for my Sensei Divining Top uh, resets. I, I don't think I ever played that card in Constructed. Um, no, I, and I, I never commuted for my Gnarled Mess, I don't believe. It might have, okay, so here's another thought. You know how sometimes you're playing dinosaur decks and there just are not enough dinosaurs that you really want to play? I hear you. I mean, incubation, if you have 12 dinosaurs in your deck, your odds of, you're, you're like, uh, you know, you're, you're pretty good. You're like, you know, two to one to actually hit a dinosaur off incubation. You obviously have other creatures, so you're hitting something. Over commune with dinosaurs. Like, community dinosaurs also gets land. That's true. <laughs> like, and I don't want the second ability, right? Like, we just spent the first part of this episode talking about how powerful Bedevil right. is. Dude, what about Merfolk? Yeah. Your Merfolk deck, you just want to go find Silvergill Adepts, right? This is like a commune with the dinosaurs for a Silvergill Adept deck. I don't know, man. I'm trying. It doesn't look as good as Bedevil or Absorb. I mean, that second ability is so fringe, and it's fringe when it costs you. You know, Pongify and and its cousins only got played in block. I don't think those were very, very popular in standard, and that costs one mana. Right? Three mana is too much for Frog Lizard. At least you can exile something, I guess. That's like a big body, though. I mean, like... It's too bad you can't exile a creature or Planeswalker to give him a 3-3 green frog. You like, know? I mean, just think about the cards that you want to exile versus destroy, right? Like, how much of a downgrade uh, to a Rekindling Phoenix is the 3-3 three, three frog lizard relative to the fact that you just spent a card on it? Yeah. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not that much worse. I mean, it obviously doesn't fly... Um, Obviously, a smaller power, but you just discarded a card and used. Three. This is just not the. Uh, this is just not the flexibility of Beast Within. Oh no! I mean, Beast Within can hit anything. Right. Right. All right. What about Gruel Spellbreaker? This is one red green for a three three with Riot, which means it can enter the battlefield with your choice of a plus one plus one counter, or haste. And then it also has Trample to begin with, and as long as it's your turn, you and Gruel Spellbreaker have Hexproof. I think this card is a riot. I think this card's good. Right? So if you start on Land War Elf, it's pretty scary. You can either be crashing in for three on turn two, um, or you can produce a 4 4 for three. I think. I don't think that I would want just a four-four trample for three. That off. maybe I would actually. That's not that. That's not. That's, that that's not bad. No, that's I mean, not bad at all. I'm a. What was that five-four guy for three? I liked um, in the Naya deck. What's his name? The Woolly Thoctor. Woolly. Th- I was in for Woolly Thoctor. So that's one more power than than a four-four. Trample. Yeah, but you would lux it on Smiter. Sometimes. Yes, I'd Smiter. But, I mean, I would totally be in for, like, a Bogart Ram Gang. This guy's a Bogart Ram Gang sometimes. Yeah, this guy's your choice of the Smiter or the Ram Gang, but he's got the extra tactical implications of how often you can do things where you're just like, they have removal, you play him with haste, and now you're getting a Ram Gang that is hexproof for a turn, you know? Oh, I think that that extra hexproof thing is probably going to have some some clever implications, right? Like... Is this pretty good against, I don't know, Settle the Wreckage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, as long as you have a Gruel Spellbreaker, they can't Settle the Wreckage, you right? Yeah, I think that's pretty solid. Um, 
I, I think the, the, the tension, it, it's like an internal tension, right? It's not like a metagame tension. Because sometimes you just want to, like, haste in to beat up a Jeskai deck, but then you're walking into Clarion. So you, <laughs> you want to be 4-4 four, four so that you don't get Clarion. So I think that, that's, like I said, it's an internal tension. I, I think that clever beatdown players will figure out what to do there. Yeah, it, it's going to depend on the, the rest of the situation, but I do like that they're making beatdown cards with so much play to them. Um, so what about Frenzied Aerinx? Is that how you say that? So the Frenzied, uh, so Frenzied Arilax is two red-green for a 3-3 Riot. And then it also has Trample, since apparently every 3-3 Rioter has Trample. Uh, this one's ability is that it... Uh, you can pay six mana to give it plus three plus zero until on a turn. Uh, and because this is so much better than uh, you and a gruel spellbreaker having hexproof on your turn, uh, the frenzied Arnix costs four instead of three. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seems like a generally weaker card than the gruel spellbreaker. I think so. Uh, the the only thing that I'd say is a kind of wrinkle of this is I can imagine strategies that just they have like a giant mana engine at the, at the top end, so maybe fire breathing for a kill. Or do you think that's that's too much of a stretch? Oh yeah, I think it's too much of a stretch. I think the four spot in standard right now is just so dynamite. Yeah, I mean, you would just never play this over a rekindling with the X, like ever, right? Like, th- like haste is... Yeah, I, hey, maybe in my cat cat tribal deck. Uh, maybe these tribal. Um, but I I don't think I would play this over a Rekindling Phoenix ever. I think Rekindling Phoenix is such an impressive performer at four. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that one. So we are running a little bit low on new ones, but I do wonder what you think of Aeromunculus. Uh, the old homunculus mutant. Well... The homunculus mutant, um, I'll try not to pronounce its its regular name, is 1GU for a 2-3 flying. So it's, I, I was like, oh, is this 3-3? Three, three? Is it just way better than a gnarled mass? No. It's 2-3 flying. So it's kind of like a, a Trigon Predator size and casting cost to begin with. But then it has this adaptability. So uh, 2GU, adapt 1. If it has no plus 1, plus 1 counters on it, you can put a plus one plus one counter on it for four. Uh, not a buyer for constructed. Nah. Yeah, but it does seem promising. I mean, I like kicker and you know having uh, effectively another form of monstrosity. You know the way to spend people's uh, mana to uh, to get a little bit of an advantage. Um, there are two uh, two more new cards that we've not yet had a chance to discuss. Dovin, Architect of the Law, four white blue, legendary planeswalker with five loyalty. His plus one ability, you gain two life and draw a card. His minus one ability, tap target creature, it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. And minus nine, tap all permanents, target opponent controls, that player skips their next untap step. Uh, and remember, these are t- part of the dual decks, you know, the planeswalker theme decks. Yeah, I don't. I don't imagine I would be casting this Dovin with somebody else's mana if they they gave me the option. <laughs> I don't. Think yeah, it's a super exciting card for for constructed. Yeah, I don't think this card would be that exciting at four. Yeah, it's just like maybe. I think like its plus one ability is fantastic, and then the other two abilities are awful. Yeah, but it's just not fantastic enough for a six drop. Oh no no no! It, you can't have a card that's like six. Gain two life and draw one card. I mean, maybe it's a... a let's think about this. No. Again. Nah. What if, what if it was... S- not close. Six, gain seven life, draw one card? Still not close. Okay. No, no, no. That might be. <laughs> that, I think that would be close. I think I would be in for that, actually. If it was literally plus one, you gain seven life and draw a card? No, I was thinking they kill it, right? <laughs> so that's six of the seven life. Oh, no. I'm a, I want to gain seven life and draw a card every turn. Oh. Well, that would be really powerful. In yeah, I would be in for situations. that. I would be in for that. Like, that would crush red decks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. That would be unbeatable for red. Yeah. So Dovin's opposition is Domre City Destroyer. Four red green for a four loyalty planeswalker. Plus two. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one in haste until on a turn. Minus three. 
uh, Domri deals three damage to any target, and minus eight, put three plus one plus one counters on each creature you control, they gain trample until end of turn. So it's kind of an overrun, but from here on out. Um, yeah, I think this card is also not exciting. So the the plus two ability gaining I think I think I would play this one if it costs four. Yeah, but it costs six. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not close. If this one costs four, like that middle ability is pretty good, right? Like Oh yeah, that's what I was four. thinking. Nug a creature. <laughs> you still have a point. Dude, it's not like alive. it's not like a it's not like a plus two ability that goes ultimate in two turns. A plus two ability that's plus one plus one your team in haste. That is not a bad ability on a four cost planeswalker. Yeah, but unfortunately, this is a six cast cost planeswalker. Um, yes, I am. I am not excited about either of these. The thing that I like is sometimes we have the uh, you know kind of the precon the precon decks do produce uh, one of these six or so casting cost planeswalkers that does see play in standard. Like, we've seen the Ajani, for example, see play in standard, which is... I like it when that happens, but these are far, far off, I think, from from being constructed playable. Yeah, I don't think it's even close. I think you are absolutely right. We, we really don't get a lot out of those... Do, but that's okay. It does sort of suggest that maybe there will be a Domri Rod and a Dovin Ban of some sort. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Dovin's got a lot of work to do. But maybe as long as he stays away from that five spot and isn't trying to compete with Teferi, maybe there's some spot, you know, maybe there's some opportunity there. Um, at least we got Absorb and Bedevil. And I think. Uh, Bedevil, obviously, if there's enough support for Rakdos Aggro, will be a fixture. And it already slots neatly into any of the sort of Grixis decks that people have been playing. Uh, do, you think there's, do you think there's much, you know, possibility of something like a Mardu deck emerging with Bedevil? Ooh, Mardu. Um, yeah, because, I mean, with both, you know, having access to both Blood Crypt and Godless Shrine radically changes the rules of engagement for how you can build a Mardu deck. I do, I do. I'll tell you why. Um, we've seen Boros decks that uh, play Experimental Frenzy already, right? Like, either they play them in the sideboard. Generally, they play them in the sideboard. Sometimes they play them in the main deck with treasure maps, etc. I think that a black-red deck of the same stripe might be might be really exciting, Especially if you've got like a lot of really cheap cards, like let's call it a duress, like something like that, which is like an interaction that you might want to have. It's very inexpensive mana wise, so you can play a lot of them, like rack them up together the way that red decks put together like a bunch of bad creatures. Um, you maybe maybe those two strategies can marry. One of the big holes in the current crop of experimental frenzy decks is they actually get worse at removing large creatures once frenzy hits the table. Um, because, you know, sometimes they're like, all right, it's, I'm just in a regular game. I can put together a lightning strike and a shock to kill a 5-5, five five, right? That becomes highly inconsistent once Frenzy's in play. Uh, and so True. the addition of a card like Bedevil is actually very, very attractive um, for, for a deck to, to have as, as something they might want to play, especially main deck. Um, so maybe, uh, I, I am trying to think, like, it's certainly the case there's red-white decks that want to do that already, and so like this is a card that would go straight in and they would be welcome to be, to be able to do it, so long as had the mana. Well, I see, I, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I do think that BBR cost is going to be kind of prohibitive with some of the existing Boros and white sort of ways of looking at, at things, but I, I, I wonder what sort of other Mardu decks might be possible. I do think that Bedevil could slot nicely into an upgrade to Golgari. Like, I think that Golgari gaining both Stomping Ground and Blood Crypt, um, Golgari is a, a strategy that would appreciate having some of its Vraska's Contempts only cost three. Oh, definitely. And we've already seen some versions of Golgari, like, splashing Banefires after sideboarding to kill to kill blue decks so like it's it's already there that they are using their their land search um or other people's settle the wreckages to find red mana and this is only what requires one red uh additionally there is the question of is it time for goblin chain whirler to get uh you know to get get its combo on with uh if you give it death touch 
now that you actually have both Boyd Crypt and Stopping Ground so that your mana doesn't have to be just uh, atrocious, so that you can be uh, packing, you know, uh, the other Golgari split card, Status Statue. I don't know if it's time, but I know that if you ever pulled that off, it would be pretty exciting. The tough part is that Statue is just so much less appealing of an option now that you have access to Bedevil. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty overcosted and clunky by comparison. Um, there's actually one card I wanted to mention that we talked about last week that I just wanted to, to put like a small revision on. Yep. Um, Light Up the Stage is way better than I originally thought. I thought there we go. There we go. I thought it was this turn, but it's... you can. That's what uh, I told you. It was Divination. It's, it's very, very good. I yeah. did not appreciate how good this is. It's only in the case that you... Now, you, it's until the end of your next turn, so it's yeah. not like you have forever. No, no, but it's fine, right? Like, But it, the only case where you get stuck is if you just like play your third land, cast Light up the Stage, and then go like land, land. That's the, and even in that case, you get to play one of the lands, right? So, but that's, that's it. In every other situation, it's actually a, just a proactive divination that sometimes costs one. Like well, this, you don't get to hold the options forever. You do got to use them before the end of your next yeah, turn. But us res, red mages, we're impatient. yeah, I agree. We're impatient. Yeah. We're casting. I agree. Everywhere. I agree. I think this is a sweet mechanic, and I think the until the end of your next turn mechanic is something I would like to see more on the red card drawers, not just uh, this turn. Yeah, I think I think that's going to set up some really cool moments. I'm excited for light up the stage. And once I realized that this was the case, uh, I think this card's actually pretty exciting for modern and. Like, there's this whole new trend of red aggro decks in Modern that are different than the ones that we've been playing for the last couple of years, you know, that are based around Lightning Helixes and Boros Charms and stuff, I don't, that have uh, just things that cost one, like tons of, of one-drop creatures and, and just everything costs one. This card kind of is, is one casting cost enough to, uh, to fit into that paradigm. Definitely. All right. All right, man. Uh, hopefully the uh, the new year is going to bring with it, uh, you know, uh, a preview, a spoiler season hitting fast and hard. Um, I know we'll be back uh, next week with a preview ourselves, right? Yes, it's an exciting preview. Yep. Look forward to seeing you then, man. All right. Bye-bye, Patrick. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year.